right, can everyone hear me? Yes. Wonderful. I am uh, excited to see such an enthusiastic crowd at our uh, Women's History Month colloquium. Uh, we are going to get started. I would like to uh, introduce Interim Assistant Dean Paula Veras from Student Development, and she's going to bring us some words of welcome this morning. Thank you, Ebony. I'm delighted to be here with you all this morning, and on behalf of the York College Women's Center, the Division of Student Development, and the Office of the President, I welcome you to our Women's, Hi Women's History Month colloquium. When I think about Women's History Month, I reflect on the fortitude, spirit, courage, dedication, determination, and strength of countless women heroes and pioneers who have made great sacrifices, broken down barriers, created new opportunities, and at times even risked their lives for the greater good. Women who inspire us, encourage us, provide us with examples of how to make a difference and help us in our lives and careers. We have all benefited greatly from the examples set by many impressive women, from our mothers and grandmothers, from our mothers to grandmothers, to Rosa Parks, Hillary Clinton, and Sonia Sotomayor. I know that without my mother's vision and sacrifice as a Dominican immigrant to this country, who believed in the power of education, I would not be standing before you today. She instilled the value of public service as she worked very hard to achieve the American dream, strengthen our society, and improve the lives of many individuals in Dominican communities. She serves as a daily reminder that if we believe in ourselves, we can make a real difference, we should, which should be every day and not only during the month of March. While we celebrate the accomplishments of women as we know, as we now benefit from the expansion of women's rights, it is equally important to acknowledge that women still have a long way to go. It is a process that is continuing. We still have to make more strides politically, socially, and economically. We need to empower ourselves and women to make a difference, and you are doing that right now, right here, through education. At York, we have a responsibility to foster and encourage the careers and development of you all the next generations of women leaders who are making your own history every day. Please continue to be challenged, excited, and inspired. I hope you enjoy the rest of the program and thank you for your participation today. Thank you, Dean Veras, for those uh, powerful words. Uh, we, at this point, um, before we get into the, the meat of the colloquium, um, we're gonna take a little side break to talk about a very important project that is new and that we're starting here at York. As we've seen on the news and on the internet, domestic violence and intimate partner violence is pervasive in our society. Uh, according to the 2013 Global Review by the World Health Organization, 35% of women worldwide have experienced either physical or intimate partner violence. And some uh, organizations put that number as high as 70%, all right? Here in the United States, 43% of um, dating college women report experiencing abusive dating behaviors, uh, including physical, sexual, uh, technology, or verbal or controlling abuse. Uh, so, the statistics are staggering and quite frankly, unacceptable. And so we got together here at York to do something about it. Um, we created a project called York Saves and on your tables, you should have a flyer for the program. Uh, it's a collaborate endeavor jointly sponsored by the Counseling Center, uh, the Men's Center, Student Health Services and the Women's Center, all right, within the Division of Student Development. And within each of our departments, we all do small events that focus on domestic violence every month. And so we wanted to get together to make a more of a, a collaborative uh, difference, all right? And while I could sit here and make a brochure and talk about domestic violence, which I do, so you'll see me doing that, we thought it would be even better if we could enlist you guys out here, the students, to help us in that endeavor. And so York Saves, uh, is a, is a peer-led outreach program, right? 
where we're going to be utilizing York students to help us spread the message, all right? To educate people and to um, empower people to speak out against domestic violence. This new program is made possible by a grant from the Verizon Foundation. Okay, our offices, uh, along with uh, Mondell Seely, I know she's here somewhere. There she is from Institutional Advancement. Um, we came together and we're fortunate enough to receive a grant from the Verizon Foundation to support our efforts to educate and promote awareness of domestic and intimate partner violence. Today, we are very happy to have Patrick Lespinas here to kick off this exciting new project. Also today, we have here uh, Dr. Choi from our counseling office, as well as Marva Frederick from our health services office. Jonathan Quash couldn't be here today, but I know he wishes that he were. Um, uh, Jonathan Quash from the Mail Initiative. In addition, we do have a few students from our inaugural York Saves um, class here. Could those students who've signed up for York Saves please stand up? All right. Thank you. So these students, along with probably about 15 others, will be trained as domestic violence advocates. All right. They'll be uh, going through a training and they'll receive a certificate and they'll be able to help us spread the word. Um, and so we'll have 20 students this semester, 20 students in the fall and 20 students in the summer. And so we'll have 60 domestic violence advocates here on York College's campus to help us spread the word and promote and educate and awareness about it. So we're very, very proud of those students. If you, thank you. If you were unable to sign up this semester, that's okay. We are still looking for students for next semester and in the fall. So if this is something that you wanna do, we would love to have you. We would love to have you. So without further ado, I'm going to bring up our uh, guest, Patrick, Patrick Lespinas from the Verizon Foundation. Uh, Dr. Choi, Ms. Frederick, could you guys come up as well? And this is very exciting. We have, I'm putting this in my office. <laughs> yes, we're going to step in front of the podium and uh, have a photo. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. On my way here uh, this morning in the car, I was talking to my boss at Verizon and he asked me where I was going and I told him that I was going to go see my boss. And he said, you're talking to your boss. And I said, well, you don't understand. At your college, I have a boss and my boss is Dr. Marcia Keys. Um, and uh, for those of you who do not know, Dr. Keys is celebrating her 10th year anniversary as your college's president. And I must say that uh, I've been on the foundation board for a number of years, uh, and I couldn't imagine myself leaving even when my term expired if not for having Dr. Keyes there uh, and being a part of her leadership and stewardship of this fantastic institution. You know, at Verizon, our culture and our values really drive our every action. Uh, my job at the company is to really bring communities together, whether they be elected officials, nonprofit organizations, institutions of higher education and the overall community. Uh, we have a deputy mayor here in the audience who's gonna be a part of your panel and she, more th so than anyone here, knows that it's really, really hard um, to bring disparate, disparate communities, stakeholders together 
in pursuit of public policy. And so my job from an advocacy perspective is not that easy, a lot of conflicting views. But one thing that everyone is on board with, it's this issue of ending domestic violence, intimate partner violence, and sexual assault. That's one issue that resonates across the board. And so when Verizon wanted to partner with an organization, right, because we feel that students in colleges are a prime target, uh, we looked to a lot of colleges and universities across the region. Your college was first to come to mind. Under the leadership of Ebony Jackson, Mindell Seeley, uh, and all the others in the various programs that will take part of the York Saves program, we really feel that we can begin uh, to move the needle at least a little bit, right? We can't do it ourselves. We don't see ourselves as putting money at a problem to solve the problem. We feel that if everyone comes together, elected officials, pol policymakers, community leaders, uh, nonprofit leaders, that we can at least begin to make a difference. And so it's uh, wonderful to be here this morning. It's wonderful to partner with your college. We are confident that under the stewardship of Ebony Jackson uh, and all the others that she's brought to the table, that we will be able to make a difference. And so thank you for having me and have a great rest of the conference. work with you these eight or so years. We knew each other a little bit before you came to Verizon. Uh, and then somebody connected us, uh, asking us if we would um, ask you to serve on our foundation board. And we have not looked back. And so I'm really delighted that you have been able to get us a small amount of support to help this effort. And I've got to say, um, the folks who led it, Mondell is always out there helping to find us the money, helping us to write the grants, putting our ideas out. Uh, Ebony, really pleased with the work that you did prior to getting this funding, because if you hadn't done that work, quite frankly, I don't think Verizon would fund it, because we started to do this work before. And other people who are in the room, including Jonathan Quash, who, hap who, who doesn't happen to be here today. So really, yeah, oh, he did come in. Ah, Jonathan, you came in. Oh, you didn't get it, the photo up. We'll get you later. <laughs> we'll get you later. So um, we're right on time. We're really, uh, uh, Ebony, thanks for running such a tight ship. Um, we're right on time. We've got a great audience. How about a little applause for the audience? Oh, yeah. We've got a great audience. Uh, and this sort of comes together from different parts of the college. It's really nice to have that collaboration. So it's my pleasure and delight to introduce our keynote speaker. And I'm going to take a little bit more time, that, because we are on time, not going to be more than three minutes, uh, but I'm going to go a little bit beyond what you see in, in the program uh, because really it's inspirational and it's important for us to appreciate and to know a little bit of the details of the people who are talking with us. And so I have the pleasure of introducing Ms. Joyce Roche, who I am happy to say is a friend. <laughs> And she's a friend through a friend. Because <laughs> uh, another friend, Mira Coleman, who is a longer time friend with her than I am, introduced us probably 20 or so years ago when I was at Bronx Community College. And Mary and I are fast friends. And so now I include Joyce as part of my fast friends. And it's nice to have her here. As a trailblazer in the corporate world for 25 years, Joyce Roche mentored women by encouraging them to find their voices and take bold career risks to excel. Her vision for empowered business women carried over into her work on behalf of girls when in 2000, she assumed the role of president and CEO of Girls Inc., the nonprofit organization whose mission is to inspire all girls to be strong, smart and bold. Before joining Girls Inc., Ms. Roche served as president and chief operating officer of Carson Products Company, 
and the Vice President of Global Marketing at Avon Products, something we know about, right? While at Avon, Ms. Roche broke new ground, becoming Avon's first African-American female Vice President, the first African-American Vice President of Marketing, and the company's first Vice President of Global Marketing. Ms. Roche has received widespread acclaim for her achievements in the business world. In 1988, 1998, excuse me, Business Week selected her as one of the, quote, top managers to watch. And in 1997, she was featured on the cover of Fortune magazine. In 1991 and 94, respectively, Black Enterprise named Ms. Roche one of the, quote, 21 women of power and influence in corporate America, and one of the 40 most powerful black executives. In 2006, she received the Legacy Award during Black Enterprise Magazine's Women of Power Summit, and in 2007, she received the Distinguished Alumna Award from Columbia University Women in Business. Ms. Roche recently published a book, and that's going to form a part of the discussion today. And you all have it in your hot little hands, right? The Empress wears no clothes. And um, it's a deeply personal memoir in which Ms. Roche shares her lifelong struggle with the imposter syndrome and offers advice to us. Ms. Roche is a graduate of Dillard University in New Orleans, holds an MBA from Columbia University, she has successfully completed Stanford University's Senior Executive Program, holds honorary doctorates, degrees from Dillard, North Adams State, and Bryant University. She currently sits on the board of directors of AT&T, of Macy's, of Tupper Brands Corp, of Dr. Pepper, Snapple Group, and the Association of Governing Boards. And that last one is really important for us because Association of Governing Boards is an association that governs colleges and universities. So you know, you see the diversity, the corporate diversity and the educational diversity. So we've got in our house today, she's also the chair of the board of the trustees of Dillard University. Patrick, how about that? And uh, 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 Trustee Robles Moran, how about that, right? <laughs> she, she, she's, she's not ordinary, this lady. <laughs> she's pretty special. And of course, she has served uh, previously on the boards of Anheuser-Busch, May Department Stores, Girls Inc., and the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. So ladies and gentlemen, we've got the fact that we have her here today is really special. And it's, it, it's as a result of all of these connections and contacts that she's able to spend some time here with us. She said, you know, I'm going to be in New York at about that time. And I said, how lucky we are. So ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Roche. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. Is it, it's still morning, I guess. Yes, it is. Good morning. Well, it really is a pleasure to be here at uh, your college uh, and help you celebrate Women's History Month. You know, I looked at something and I thought, probably like you, you thought that this was something we've been celebrating for a really long time. Actually, I think it became an effort only in the late 70s, early 80s, um, that there was a recognition that we needed to celebrate the achievements of women in this country. It kind of blows your mind, doesn't it? Um, I want to thank President Keyes, who, as you heard, is a friend. Uh, for reaching out to me about speaking at today's event. Um, and just want to comment on the uh, York Saves initiative. It is critically important uh, because the, st the statistics that Ebony mentioned, uh, actually in my work at Girls Inc., uh, girls as young as 14 were the ones who were subject to physical and, and uh, sexual abuse. So it is not, you know, just once you get in college, it happens very young, and it's something that finally in this country we're at least beginning to talk about and having some initiatives to work toward uh, improving. Uh, as President Keyes indicated, I was asked to talk a little bit about my book, The Empress Has No Clothes, Conquering Self-Doubt to Embrace Success. And it's all about the imposter syndrome, and I don't know if any of you had 
have ever heard that term before. I had not heard it until I got on this journey. Uh, but it is this um, feeling of self-doubt uh, that causes you to question your abilities even in the face of success. So um, when, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, it was something that I dealt with most of my professional career. And the interesting thing about the imposter syndrome is that most people don't know that you are dealing with this because we pride ourselves on keeping it internally. So externally, we look very confident, but the churn is happening on the inside. So um, for most of my professional career, I would feel like each new promotion, each new step up uh, was going to be the time that I was going to fail. And they were going to say, I knew we never should have given her that chance. I knew she couldn't cut it. I knew she wasn't as smart as we thought she was. So that little voice used to go off every time a new opportunity came up. And what it caused me to do was to work like crazy, over prepare for everything, and basically not enjoy the journey. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about how I acknowledge that. It really happened in 2005. I was approached by Ellen Sprague, a small, fortune small business writer who was writing a book called What I Know Now, Letters to My Younger Self. And Ellen uh, was going to give some of her proceeds to Girls Inc. And so she was telling me about her book. And so she asked me to tell her about my background because you know I was heading up Girls Inc. But she didn't know that I had been, most of my career had been on the corporate side. So it was really a career change for me. So I told her a little bit about it. And she says, oh my goodness, you need to be in this book. Well, she had about 30 women in the book. And this is the question she asked of those 30 women. She said, if you could speak to your 30-year-old self with the knowledge that you have today, what would you say? Well, it was really crazy. I mean, when she asked me that question, I, I could feel myself back at that time in corporate America when, as I described, I just you know was being successful, but I wasn't enjoying the journey. So I'm just going to tell you, share with you a little bit of my letter that was in Ellen's book. Uh, so you'll get a sense of what started this journey. The letter says, Dear Joyce, you may not have set out to be a pioneer, but here you are, out front, one of the few African-American women working up the corporate ladder. You achieve more every year, but each leap exerts more pressure. Who would have thought that success could feel so much like a burden? Uh, at the time that I did it, I was at Revlon, because I spent a couple of years at Revlon, too. And it said, I said here at Revlon, you're setting a personal record, working morning till night and both days on weekends. Exercise, forget about it. You can't even plan a lunch, because chances are a meeting will be called at noon. You're not complaining, because strangely, there's a giddiness to such hard work. Well, this is what you tell yourself, and that's all true, but it only goes so far. Ever wonder why the glow wears off so soon? Because somewhere deep inside, you don't believe what they say, and you think it's only a matter of time before you stumble and they discover the truth. At the end of the letter, I said, stop it now. You're not an imposter. You're the genuine article. You deserve a place at the table. And at the end of the day, people will remember you not for the hours you worked, but for the difference you made in their lives. Well, when that letter, when Ellen's book came out, I learned two things. Uh, Ellen, when Ellen's book came out, um, my letter was one of two that was excerpted and reprinted in O Magazine. And when it was reprinted, I got letters and notes from tons of people, many who I didn't know, saying, you're telling my story. You need to do a book. Well, I didn't think about doing it uh, then. But um, I also learned at that time what I was describing in that letter was called the imposter syndrome. Because I was doing a, a panel for Ellen, and someone said, well, when did you first learn that you have the imposter syndrome? And I'm going, what? Uh, and so I didn't know it actually had been researched by two psychotherapists, Dr. Pauline Clance and Suzanne Imes. And they had done research in the late 70s with 150 highly successful women. And they coined the term the imposter syndrome. 
and they described it uh, a little bit like this. They said, despite outstanding academic and professional accomplishments, women who experience the, the imposter phenomena persist in believing that they're really not bright and have fooled anyone who thinks otherwise. Numerous achievements which one might expect to provide ample evidence of superior intellectual functioning do not appear to affect the imposter belief. Well, it blew me away when I read that because that was basically what I was describing in my letter without knowing that there was this thing. But the great thing about it is at the end of their research, they talked about what happens when a person, and I'm using that intentionally, not just women, finally is able to acknowledge their imposter. And they said, then um, they said she begins to be free of the burden of believing she's a phony and can more fully participate in the joy, zest, and power of her accomplishments. And that, you know, that was, you know, that's how you want to feel. We spend so much time in these things that we call careers. They shouldn't feel like a burden that we're carrying around on our, on our backs all the time. Well, uh, the second thing, though, that I learned, other than the name, was that I wasn't alone. Because when all those notes came, I realized that a lot of people, what I was describing, a lot of people had those same kinds of feelings. And like me, I thought I was making a personal confession that I had never acknowledged openly to anybody when I contributed to Ellen's book. But then I started hearing people talk about they felt the same way. One of the people who really blew me away and what made me know that it wasn't just women was when the reprint in O Magazine happened, the CEO of AT&T said to me at a meeting, he said, you know, Joyce, uh, his name is Ed Whitaker. Uh, he's now the retired CEO of AT&T. He said, this isn't just something that women deal with. He said, I've dealt with this my entire career. Well, that blew me away because if you have ever seen, I'll just describe the person I'm talking about. He is a huge, big Texan who dominates a room when he walks into it. And for him to tell me that he dealt with the imposter syndrome his whole career, that really blew me away and gave evidence again to the idea that people don't know that we're dealing with this. We hide it very, very well. Well, when that happened, I didn't really think, as I said, this was in 2005, and Ebony is going to keep me on time. Uh, 2005, when I contributed to Ellen's book, um, I didn't think about doing a book at that point, even though that was kind of the message. And, but when I stepped down from Girls, Inc. in 2010, I thought, I said, you know, if I could understand my own journey and understand how I ultimately learned how to quiet that voice, then doing a book would be well worth it if I could help others who are on that journey know that you don't have to deal with it the whole time. There is a way to turn that voice off. Now, I intentionally, again, use the term of that learn to manage it because I will tell you up front, it does not go away. Any new opportunity will cause that voice to start. When I got on my first corporate board, I thought I had gotten handle on this. And as soon as I got ready to start on that board, the voice started. Uh, but you do learn how to turn it off fast. You learn how to, how to validate yourself so it doesn't allow, you don't have the anguish that you normally would be dealing with. So that's really what I wanted to help others understand. Well, in the process of deciding to do the book, I said, well, it would be my story. And I, and I worked with a collaborator, my former director of communications at Girls Inc. Was, had collaborated on nine prior books. And so he supported me in doing the book. Well, in the process, I thought it would be a lot more interesting if I could have people like an Ed men and women who I could write little vignettes of their experience in dealing with imposter syndrome, then the book would be a lot richer because people wouldn't dismiss it as saying, oh, that was her experience. Because, and then I wanted men and women in the book because I wanted that message to come across. I wanted people of color as well as Caucasians in the book because I didn't want it to be that it's just people of color who deal with this. So the people that, some of the people that are in the book that their stories that parallel in each chapter are people like Debbie Lee, who's the CEO of BET. 
uh, Val Ackerman, who uh, was the founding president of the WNBA, Eileen Fisher, the designer, uh, Eileen was in the previous book with me uh, of what I know now, Letters to My Younger Self. Uh, I mentioned Ed, he did the forward for the book, and Rick Goings is another male that I had in the book who's the CEO of Tupperware. So I wanted that message also to be, because you deal with this doesn't mean you won't be successful, but you should find joy in that success. Um, but the other really interesting thing is I interviewed people for the book I found out something. By the way, I reached out to Dr. Clance, one of the two psychotherapists, to tell her that I was going to do this book. Because I, I, I wasn't pretending to be a researcher, a psychologist, a, a psychotherapist. It was my journey. But I did want to understand what I was learning about myself and what I was learning from other people, if it made any sense. Well, I reached out, to, and so Dr. Clance was wonderful as I was interviewing people kind of validating what I was learning. But one of the real keys that I learned is that the imposter syndrome has triggers. And the triggers happen whenever you are different from the majority of the people that you are either engaging with, competing against, somehow involved with. So what I mean by that is a woman who is in a predominantly male environment will find that that will be a trigger for the imposter syndrome. And the reason behind that is you see what goes on in your mind is that you think, remember this is all internal stuff, it has nothing to do with what's going on, it might be going on, but it's what you're dealing with in your head, is as a woman in a predominantly male environment, you will think that they think that because you're a woman, you're not as smart as they are. You're not a very good leader that you, you know, whatever it is that they don't think you, you measure up. So what you do is you, you work harder to counter what you think they're thinking. <laughs> Same thing for somebody, a person of color. Perfect example, when I went to Columbia, I, went, I grew up in New Orleans and went all the way through undergrad and I went to a historically black college. Never in my life had I ever competed with anybody who didn't look like me found myself at Columbia and there were about 3% of us who looked like me. And all of a sudden I was in an environment that, you know, was foreign. Uh, I was very different from the majority of the, the students in, in the business school. And so my way of dealing with it was to keep my head down, pray that the professor never called on me, because I figured that it was just going to be my time to shine to show how much I liked. That I you know, I had grown up at a time when we got the message, whether overtly or covertly, that we might have been smart, but we weren't as smart as our counterparts. So here I was finally faced with that reality that maybe I wasn't going to measure up. So the voice went crazy. So that's what happens as a person of color when you're in an environment of, when you are in the minority and the majority is different, you think that there's a message that, they, that in their heads, they're thinking, she might be smart, but she's not, probably doesn't, doesn't have the same kind of credentials. Um, I don't know if she's ready for this. I'm not sure we should give her a chance at this. So, so you work like crazy to counter what you think they're thinking to show that, in fact, you can and do and will prove that you deserve to be where you are. And the same thing, it was interesting, because here I mentioned Ed Whitaker, white male, Rick Goings, white male. I'm saying, what could be their triggers? Their triggers were growing up, was growing up in families with limited economic means. Uh, Rick's parents didn't go to college. Ed's parents, his, his father had never finished high school. His mother went for one semester of college, and he thought he was going to work on the railroad. So all of a sudden, he decided to go to school, and his, his mother said, no, you're going to go to college. He got an engineering degree, continued to move up the ladder, but here he was finding himself competing with people who he felt and thought and assumed and knew grew up with families of great means. So for him to be in those kinds of environments, he felt like, I don't know that I fit. You know, these, these guys grew up in where they probably went skiing in the winter and they had, you know, cars uh, from the time they were 16 and they, they, you know, read the Wall Street Journal over the breakfast table and talked about the stock market. 
And so his thing was that, do I, am I accepted or acceptable? So that can be another trigger. It's essentially whenever you are different that the triggers will happen. I'm gonna share just a little bit of Debbie Lee's story, which paralyzed, uh, parallels my time at Columbia, and a little bit of Rick Goings, which talks a little bit about this economic situation that I mentioned. Uh, let's see, here's a little bit of Debbie's. It's about her time when she went to Harvard Business School. She said, Harvard is Harvard and supposedly only the best and the brightest go here. She had gone to Brown as an undergrad. She said, I went to Brown without a lot of self-doubt, but when I got to Harvard, I was suddenly anxious. I worried that maybe I didn't really belong. I was sure that at some point, someone was gonna discover that I was a mistake. I wasn't gonna be successful, and I would let my family down, my community down, and my race down. So that was a little bit of her story. Rick's story, let's see if I can find him. Rick, as I said, is the CEO of Tupperware. And when he was in college, he started his own business. And um, he you know, was very successful. He said, when I was in my 20s, I started making a lot of money. But I was living in Charlottesville, Virginia. And Charlottesville is a town of old wealth. I didn't have the kind of breeding that comes from growing up around horse forms and coming out balls. I hadn't even finished college. A fact I hid carefully. All I had was a flashy car. He said, and having people, he said, although I became a member of the country club, I never felt fully accepted. And having people look at me just as a slickster really triggered this sense that I was a fake. I was an imposter. And he ended his interview by saying, after all the learning, the success, the adventures, I'm still plagued by the imposter feelings from years ago. So this is, that's why I said it doesn't go away if you learn how to manage it. But let me just give you, because I do want to leave you with some hints on how to, uh, how to manage it. And also, again, to put that message, it doesn't mean that you won't be successful. Uh, in fact, I'm often asked, isn't it a plus that you have the imposter syndrome? Um, one of the things that is really important if you're dealing with this is don't stay silent. You first have to acknowledge it in yourself, but also you need to find a trusted friend, a coach, your partner, somebody who you can be painfully honest with that you can tell what you're feeling. Because as Dr. Klan said to me, this doesn't have any basis necessarily in reality. What it is, it's an emotional reaction to what you think that's happening in the external environment. So having somebody that you can say, here's how I'm really feeling. This is what I'm concerned about. I know I can't cut it. And they can give you the reality check. That's the second thing, get a reality check. Because we're very, it's very easy for us to acknowledge when we, the things that are wrong, the things we're weak at, but when we have to acknowledge our strengths, we get a little hesitant. We're not as forthcoming in that. So getting a reality check is a, is a critical element of this. And also, when you're talking to that person that you trust, you know, you're describing, and they can give you that reality check. Because they can tell you, you know, you may be going into a new position, and you say, oh my God, I, you know, I, I've not done this, I know this. Well, you don't think about all the stuff you have done, all the things that you bring to that, that particular position. When I talk about it now, I said, you know one of the really great techniques is when you're about to get a new opportunity. <laughs> oh, okay, when you have a new opportunity and think about where that opportunity came from and think about the people or organization that is suggesting that you're ready. And then ask yourself, what evidence did they use? Because they're looking at your experience, they're looking at your accomplishments. We need to learn, and that's all what it's all about, is learning how to internally validate yourself is how you start to learn how to quiet the voice. Become familiar with your imposter. 
find out what you're trying to prove and to whom, because again, that opens up a key, because it allows you to understand what your triggers are. Why is it going off? What is it about this group, this person, that makes me feel that maybe I don't measure up? And then begin to put the pieces together. Um, analyzing your success. Um, learning to metabolize uh, external validation. We are really, when somebody says, you did a fantastic job, what do we do? Oh, no, it wasn't a big deal. Anybody could have done it. I was just lucky. Well, no, what we should do is listen, take it in, and say thank you. That's how you learn to begin to internally validate yourself. Recognize other people for who they are, because as I said, you know, you're comparing all the time. You're comparing yourself, and you're saying, he's smarter, she's smarter, they've done more, they've got more experience, they've got more money, they've got whatever it is. But look at what your qualities are. And yeah, they may have qualities, but they've got flaws just like you do. We're not perfect, and they're not perfect. So that's one of the things to remember. And I'm just going to leave you with the last one, which is pay it forward. Um, share your joy, zest, and power. Because once you begin to understand and acknowledge it in yourself, and especially if you don't even have to be in a position where you're leading, but if you're in a leadership position and you've got people you're responsible for, the probability is that some percentage of that group is dealing with the imposter syndrome. Acknowledge it, recognize it, and help them learn how to get over the hump to get to the other side. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of a sense of what this is all about. And uh, as I always end with is remember, you deserve a place at the table. So thank you. Wow. I was over there taking notes. I don't know if anybody else was. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Roche, for, for those words. We were able to, to purchase probably about 75 copies of the book, so I see various people here making little notes in the margin. We have a lot of students who came by the Women's Center to pick up the book, and hopefully your words will help them process what they read a little bit better. So thank you so much for that. At this point in the program, we're going to take a very brief break um, so that you folks can get some lunch. I know it's lunchtime, all right? Uh, so I want to um, have a brief break so folks can get their food. Please come right back to your seats, and then we will begin our panel. We have an esteemed panel to talk about some of the things that we just heard and to share more experiences about the imposter syndrome and everything that we've been reading. So we'll take a, a brief break for you guys to uh, grab lunch, come back to your chairs, and then we'll start right back up. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. As you all are enjoying your lunch, we are going to continue our conversation, which I know will be extremely interesting. Uh, in addition to uh, Ms. Roche, we have quite a panel of esteemed uh, some of them are guests, and some of them are, are York College originals. Um, so we're very excited to um, hear more uh, perspective on the imposter syndrome um, and everything that we heard this morning. So I am going to um, uh, bring up our panel so that we can uh, hear their remarks. And we want to leave plenty of time for questions and answers. We really want to hear your perspective. We really want to have some interaction with you all uh, and the guests. So without further ado, I will get started. All right. At this point, I'm going to um, bring Miss Roche back up. She's already been introduced, so, so I won't do that again. She'll be sitting here on the end. Thank you. In addition to Ms. Roche, we are very, very lucky to have Carol Robles Roman here at York College. Please come on up. I'm going to briefly introduce you. Um, Carol Robles Roman was appointed uh, by Mayor Bloomberg in June 2002 as a member 
uh, of the board of the City University of New York, and she was reappointed in 2013 for a seven-year term. Recently, Ms. Robles Roman was appointed president and CEO of Legal Momentum, the nation's oldest nonprofit legal group dedicated to advancing the rights of women and girls. Previously, she was deputy mayor for legal affairs from January 2002 until December 2013. She served as counsel to the mayor and oversaw several city agencies, including the New York City Commission on Human Rights, the Criminal Justice Coordinator's Office, and the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence, the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings, and the Mayor's Office on Immigrant Affairs and Language Services. Ms. Robles Roman started her public service in uh, her public service career in New York City Family Court, where she worked as a senior court attorney. She chairs the Board Standing Committee on Student Affairs and Special Programs and holds membership on the Board Standing Committees on Fiscal Affairs and the Standing Committee on Faculty, Staff, and Administration. Please join me again in welcoming Ms. Carol Robles Roman. Next, I'm going to bring up a woman who many of you already know, our very own Dr. Selena T. Rogers. Hometown original. <laughs> Dr. Selena T. Rogers is an assistant professor right here at York College, um, the School uh, of a Department of Social Work. Uh, she's got a laundry list of accomplishments. Um, many of her students are here today. Thank you for coming, although I don't think Dr. Rogers gave you a choice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, Dr. Rogers, her research includes um, post-traumatic growth and sociocultural socio factors in multicultural and multi-ethnic group. Black women discourse on issues of leadership, mentoring, and trauma, and stressor exposures. Dr. Rogers also has a passion for student mentoring and strengthening communities locally and globally. She is a licensed clinical social worker with over 19 years of experience and expertise in domestic and global social work administration, academic, and practice settings. Dr. Rogers is an internationally recognized social work scholar and educator who have the honor of receiving the prestigious designation of the Fulbright U.S. Scholar. Specialist, yes, please give her a round of applause for that. Okay, as a specialist program for the United States Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs, thank you, Dr. Rogers, for being here. All right, and our panel would not be complete um, without our next guest. She is a student here at York College, because I thought it was important to have a student perspective on a lot of the things that we are talking about. And so I'd like to call up Ms. Allison Gill. All right, Allison uh, has demonstrated a, a commitment to journalism and technology as evidenced by her many pursuits in these respective fields. Allison is currently a senior here at York College, and she is the online editor of Pandora's Box, our school newspaper. Okay. Um, she is also volunteering for an organization, which I hope to work with very soon, called Black Girls Code. It's an organization dedicated to introducing computer coding and lessons to young girls from underrepresented communities. Allison is also the president of the York College Association of Black Journalists, um, as well as the Student Affairs Committee member for the New York Women and Communications Foundation. Additionally, she's also a member of the National Society of Black Engineers at NYU. Please join me in welcoming Allison Gill. So now that our panel is set, I'm going to um, give each of our panelists uh, some time to make remarks. We heard um, from Joyce Roche this morning and that was very exciting. I know I've got tons of questions. We're going to now hear some uh, brief remarks from Trustee uh, Robles Roman, followed by Dr. Rogers, and then Allison, and then we'll open it up for Q&A, I promise. We'll have plenty of time for that. So without ado, I'm going to hand it over to you to make your remarks. Thank you, Trustee. Thank you very much. Um, it's working or I'll, I'll, just talk, uh, I'll just talk real loud. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, acknowledge the incredible program that you just announced around domestic violence, the York Project, 
uh, I can't tell you how critical and how, I mean, that was like a special surprise that you, uh, for those of you that don't know, that's the, that's one of the, the issues that I'm very passionate about. And as New York City Deputy Mayor, I helped spearhead the New York City Family Justice Centers, which are, you have one here in Queens and you have one in every borough. So what you've done is you've created your own Family Justice Center holistic experts right here on campus. And um, Legal Momentum just announced yesterday uh, a program that we're calling DV Free Zones. So we're gonna figure out a way how to marry your initiative, our initiative, because our premise is this very similar to yours, is that every entity needs to know about the issues of, of violence in the workplace or wherever you are, and everybody has to be engaged. So the same way when you see somebody choking and there's always a poster somewhere, um, that's how prevalent and that's how open our conversation and transparent our conversation should be around uh, domestic violence. And so we have posters that we're envisioning will be in every workplace in America, uh, on the corporate side, on the nonprofit side, and that you will have the type of emissaries that you have here. So I, I want to congratulate Verizon <coughs> and I want to congratulate you for, for doing that. Uh, in terms of the, the wonderful presentation this morning, and we were just uh, we were just chatting afterwards. I, I want to tell you my my sort of my my my, my candid comments, um, and, and I'm, I'm going to go off of sort of the, the comments that I had prepared because this was so powerful. I was I was finishing it up last night, and I mentioned that my my little nine year old came over and he said, "What are you reading?" And I started explaining it to him, thinking. Well, he's not going to get this. And he then he started to explain to me how, as a nine-year-old, um, he's the only Hispanic in his class, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, different things that separate him. He says, "Oh, mommy, and, and back at the ranch, okay. Now I'm going to brag as a mom. Kid gets, you know, highest grades in school, scores off the charts on the national test, and he says, well, that's how I feel in school. I always feel." that I'm not really supposed to be there, and somehow somebody let me in. So so very powerful, um, never in a million years would I have even imagined to have had that conversation with, with a nine-year-old uh, Latino uh, male, uh, my nine-year-old Latino male. So so thank you for, for writing this book and, and making us aware of this, uh, that we all have. So I'm not gonna say we all have, you know, I've had it. So in terms of the, the imposter syndrome, there was, there was one statement that, that you had quoted um, the, the psychologists and the experts who had done the initial research that a lot of it may not be based in reality. So from, from my perspective, and again, I'm putting on my, my Carol Robles hat um, and not speaking for anybody else, it, it's, it's my contention that a lot of it is based in reality. And, and not, n not that everybody is sort of conspiring against women, but at the end of the day, many of us are called upon to be in environments that we are the only one. So either we're the only woman or we're the only person of color. Um, in, in, in my case, as 12 years as deputy mayor for the city of New York, there were many, many, many times that I was both the only person of color and the only woman in the room in a very high pressure, high stakes situation. And you hear things and you are in a position to see how power plays out. And many times our issues are not necessarily at the top of the list. Sometimes they're not even at the bottom of the list. They're not on the list. So if you get that, that feeling of imposter syndrome, I would argue, and, and, I'm, and, and, and I think I have felt this, that there may not be the sense of you know, you were necessarily supposed to be in this room for whatever reason. So, so that said, um, you look at the statistics, and what I, I, I do a lot of in my in my position uh, with legal momentum is look at women in leadership and look at women in power, and it, it's a, it's a very interesting picture that we see around the country. The numbers are just about flat in any area that you look at in terms of women in leadership. Whether you're talking about women on the judiciary, women in corporate America, women on boards, it's 15 to 20 percent, you know, on or about. Now how can that be, right? We are over 50 percent of the workforce. We have the credentials, we have the degrees, so all the metrics that we need to have those leadership positions, we're not there. And these numbers have been the same. So do we wring our hands? Do we say we haven't been invited to the party? Do we say, oh, no. So, so a lot of the work that has been done up to date in terms of creating power bases for women have to really be taken to, to the next level. 
So I teach a, a program uh, for, for several years called Girl Power School. Um, and, and Girl Power School on its most basic level is, is setting your own personal GPS for success. And it's starting at, at a very young age. It start, I start doing this at the high school level where I start teaching young high school girls how to network, how to mentor, how to ask, and how to feel like they are entitled to internships and all the things that many times they may not necessarily have been sort of groomed and, 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 and socialized to do. So that has been very exciting and, and very powerful to see. And I think that's part of where we need to go in terms of identifying how to change the paradigm and, and how to create, it's really a culture shift because at this stage of the game uh, where we are, to say that we're only 15 or 20% in various areas, it's, it's, not, it's not where we need to be. And so what's, what needs to happen sort of culturally there is, is something what I like to call the, the ethics of inclusion. I mean, at this point, uh, forget about sort of diversity initiatives and EEO initiatives in and, 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 and corporate America or nonprofits around the judiciary. That's all very important. But there is a, there's a moral imperative where when you have a workforce, it should be reflective of everybody who's, who's part of the community. So that's something that I think has to really start getting into the, the ethos of, of what we do. So how do you do that? You can't you know, one day you know, go up to the CEO of a company, or maybe you can, and maybe you could teach us how to tell you know, sort of the president of X. Um, and, and many entities, and my organization does do that. But part of it is also training ourselves and what to do when the situation presents itself. Um, I had introduced with the uh, International uh, Junior League a program called Gender Justice Warriors. And, and they, they really enjoyed it because this is, uh, obviously this is a group from all over the country and you have women from all walks of life. Um, and, and just saying, okay, we're all gonna find ourselves in situations where, um, you know, you see that there's an opportunity for increasing a power shift or a hiring decision. Um, I'll, I'll give you sort of an example, you know, sort of a hypothetical. Uh, as, as, uh, as a trustee, I sit on a lot of search committees. We recently sat on the search committees for our, our wonderful new chancellor. And, and many times you'll be in a situation, um, as deputy mayor, we did this for the judiciary. I was one of the appointing authorities with the mayor for family court judges and criminal court judges. And so you'll sit down and somebody will present you with a, these are the resumes for these 10 judicial openings. And you go through them and you say to yourself, right? And maybe it's the imposter talking, I'm not sure who, but you're saying, okay, these resumes are all men. And they're all non-diverse men. And so you're kind of looking around the room hoping that somebody else is gonna say something because it can't be, right? This is like crazy. And so somebody else will come in and say, well, this is great, and uh, I think we're gonna really like interviewing Steve. And so you're kind of just waiting for that other shoe to drop. So I was in a, a women's leadership uh, conference and we were discussing this scenario that I had set out. And one woman said, and she was an executive vice president of a global media company, she said, yes, that happens to all of us, you know, in, in different places. And she says, and, you know, nobody wants to be that girl. And for those of you that are a little bit older, that girl was Marlo Thomas, you know, with the hair like this. And so I argue sometimes we do have to be that girl, you know, and not, not in, a, in a strident adversarial way, but why, you know, we, we are in certain positions. So this, you don't have to be a deputy mayor for this to happen. You don't have to be sitting on a board of a school. You know, you could be at the PTA. This could be happening in your workplace. This could be happening in class, you know, where uh, an instructor has assigned something and there is a decidedly gender balance in, in the wrong direction um, because it's not, it's not inclusive, right? So that's the word that we're really looking for. We're not saying it has to be all one thing or, one, or the other. So the gender justice warrior in us, right? We're not carrying spears, but <laughs> we are making sure that the ethics of inclusion are being followed and we find the right words, we find the right sponsors, the right mentors, uh, you have your coach, I mean that is the most, you don't just go running in, you have that coach person that you've already identified that you can say, can I run something past you? What would you do in this situation? What should I do? And then you come back with a strategy and you come back with kind of like a posse and a team to help you address that issue. 
Um, and I and I promise you, this is the way you know the the, the other folks are getting the people that they want in place, and so. We have to follow suit, and we have to make sure that we're uh, we're being properly mentored. Uh, part of the, the Girl Power School, setting your personal GPS, is the networking and just knowing that the person that you're sitting next to today is somebody who you should get to know and make sure you stay in contact with, and that relationship will will develop into something. You know, the, the, the guys do it on the golf course. I have tried and it's just not working. Um, but there are ways. Maybe the spa. Huh? Maybe the spa. I like that. I like that. So, so um, I'm, getting, I'm getting the signal. But in terms of the, the imposter syndrome, I say that um, when we get that feeling, we have to do a really careful gut check and we have to see what is our gut telling us because you know that and you have to trust that so whether it's talking about this or guy asks you to marry you and you, you're thinking well, your gut is telling you something you gotta listen and you gotta run <laughs> <laughs> that's a very very valuable uh gift that has been given to us and many times we try to put it somewhere else uh, but we have to listen to it and we have to lean into it and then we have to work with it and if that does mean if it tells you you have to work twice as hard then you have to work twice as hard and we have all been there and we've all done that uh, but it also may mean that may not be the place for you maybe they don't deserve to have you working twice as long if they don't recognize the, the, the authentic self that you have presented them with. So um, look forward to, to lots of questions and, uh, and thank you for this opportunity to present today. Yeah, I know I have some student scholars in here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, better. First, I want to say uh, thank you to Ms. Jackson um, from the Women's Center and certainly President Keyes um, for you know helping to facilitate this phenomenal uh, discussion today. I also want to say I appreciate the comments that were made and I appreciate our keynote speaker, uh, Ms. Roche. I am a clinical social worker and so I need to start there first when I begin to unpack this um, concept or this phenomenon of imposter th syndrome. And what, when I first heard it, I never had heard the phrase before. And so for me, I'm also gonna talk about it in my brief remarks from the context of being both a clinical social worker, but also from the context of being a researcher. First and foremost, as a clinical social worker, we come from an empowerment perspective. So when I saw the word syndrome, Immediately, it said to me that this is a medical model and that's not a basis in which we're grounded in terms of our training, our skills, and our knowledge. So I wanted to think about like what would be the best way to help my student scholars that are in the room understand that while this may exist, there's an alternative perspective. Okay, so that's where I want to start. When I look at imposter or pretending the need to be someone and to deceive others, in social work, we talk about showing up your genuine and your authentic self. So from the very beginning, part of what we need to do is to unlearn what you may have been conditioned to know who you think you should be. From a research standpoint, I want to extend um, Ms. Roche's point in terms of um, Dr. Clance and, and Dr. Imes' introduction or the coining of this term or this, this, this concept, they are psychologists, so their frame of reference is a little different than the, the, what I have to offer today. And their, their initial study that was conducted with 150 women were predominantly white women. So I want to talk to you from the perspective of being a black woman where's where my research is grounded in terms of historical trauma and the racial stereotypes that black women endure and talk about the imposter syndrome in the context of presumed incompetent, which is a phenomenal book that's out there that's talking about black women and all women of color in academia and what that looks like. <laughs> when we talk about being an imposter, that's not necessarily everyone's narrative. I think part of what we really want to look at is what creates those conditions that people take on that they're an imposter. 
Um, I, I think the reality of gender is certainly um, an issue that we, we are put into that we don't have the right to stand up and be present and be purposeful as women, as women of color, as all women around the world that I've interacted with globally, there are certain societal and cultural conditions that dictate that you have a societal role in which you must, you must ascribe to. What I am saying to all of us in the room is we have a responsibility to challenge that. I spend a lot of time mentoring not just younger women, I spend a lot of time mentoring all people. And that mentoring comes across that says, you have the possibilities. You, ha you can do this. You need someone to help you understand how to get it done. But it's possible. And I think when we stay focused, and I'm not saying that people's narrative of you know, just the fear of showing up, the, the anxiety of showing up to new circumstances, that will always exist. I have traveled on to six continents. Trust me, when I show up, I'm different, okay? I am quite different. But here's the thing, I'm not going anywhere. I'm purposefully present. And so my goal and my intent is to engage people to want to be interested in who I am versus what they've been conditioned to understand about who they think I should be. That's different. So when we say imposter, I'm saying be purposeful. And the way to do that is to mentor, to align yourself with people who can help you understand what your role is. Situations that may be anxiety provoking, meet them where they're at and find people that can help you to go through the process. Because the anxiety is real. But how do you move through the process? I have student scholars that just show up at my office that have nothing to do with social work. And it's because I keep my doors open and I'm purposeful in my discussion of wanting to have conversations with everybody. How can I help you get to where you're going and to move beyond what you're conditioned to know about who you should be versus who, who you are, who you just may not know who you are until you begin to unpack that, that package that does exist. What did I also want to say? And I, I want to kind of go back to what the research says. Right? So although my research has not specifically looked at the, the concept or the variable for my student scholars who are research in my research class um, of imposter syndrome, I have looked at historical trauma in the, con the context of racial stereotyping. And so when we talk about, and there are uh, themes that Dr. Clarence and Dr. Imes talk about in terms of the, these four characteristics one of them was um, dil um, being diligent, the diligence. Another one was feeling um, of being phony, using charm, avoiding display of confidence. And so when I started to think about that in the context of my research, I said we need to be goal-oriented. Goal we need to be visionary when it's you know, diligence. Feeling or being phony. No, in social work we talk about being authentic and genuine. So we have to change the lexicon. We have to change the language of what we need people to hear and know about who we are when we show up using charm. No, it's called engagement. It's, you know, here's the thing. I think people want to ascribe with gender, oh, she's flirty, or oh, she has this Jezebel syndrome when we talk about in the context of, of just the racial um, gender biases and stereotypes. That's not what we're speaking about. And if you understand the context from a positive perspective, you begin to use that language. When you understand that language and you model that language, then that's what you own, that's what you breathe, that's what you live, that's what you model, that's what you give off to the rest of everyone you come into contact with. Um, the whole notion of avoiding display of confidence as I said, and if you have not met me, I show up purposeful and present everywhere. So when I'm in a classroom, I need my student scholars to be clear. When I'm at the United Nations, and I had several of them there with me the other day, I show up purposeful and clear. When we show up in Albany every year advocating for policy, we all have to show up purposefully and clear. When I show up in Selma and they're marching across the bridge, I need them to be present and respectful of the elders that have come before them. So that is my introduction to, and my response to the imposter syndrome, but a well-written book, but just my perspective. Hi, everybody. Hello. Um, okay, so for me, I'm going to be talking about the imposter syndrome 
from the perspective of a college student, someone that isn't necessarily in the professional field yet, uh, I feel like as a college student, it's really easy to view yourself in that light as an imposter, right? Because if you're talking from the perspective of a CEO who has had tons of accomplishments, who have been on boards and foundations, and they tell you that they feel like they're an imposter, by default, we're just like, yeah, okay, you, you've done fantastic things, but what have I done? You know, you don't feel like you've done enough. So it's really easy for us to um, feel that way about ourselves. Um, and especially when it comes to, say, even if you're in high school, filling out applications for colleges, filling out applications for jobs and internships, writing your cover letter and being told, you have to say this, 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 and this, you have to dress like this, do this when you go to the interview, make sure you smile, make sure you do these things that you probably would not do, because it's just not, not necessarily not who you are, but you're feeling forced to act a certain way just to get a job. And I feel like a lot of times we end up trying to mold ourselves to fit the job <laughs> instead of trying to find a job that fits us. But I don't, I think that the reason that we do that is because we don't feel like we've done enough or paid our dues enough to say, I'm gonna go into a career with a job that I want that fits me um, because we feel like we have to run through loops and do whatever is offered to us until we get to that point where we can decide what we want. Um, now for me, I guess I've been dealing with the imposter syndrome, if that's what you want to call it, since a child. You know, I was always in honor classes from first grade up, um, usually the only minority, not minority, the only black girl in the classroom. Um, but I, I guess I didn't really consciously notice it at first. Um, I know that there were a lot of times, and I'm sure that this has happened to lots of you guys, when you were little and all your friends are saying, oh, I'm not studying for this test, I'm not gonna study, and then they all get hundreds and you might not <laughs> because you listen to them and you believe them, not knowing that their parents were on them when they got home and they had to study and they were probably lying to you. Uh, and then you don't do well because you were like, I thought we weren't studying together, guys. What happened? And of course, they're not gonna admit that they went home and did that. So you're sitting there thinking, man, all these kids don't have to study and I have to study. Maybe I don't belong here. Why do I have to work way harder than everybody else? Because we're not seeing everybody's behind the scenes. And we're always comparing ourselves to everybody's behind the scenes. Um, and I think that that has to do a lot with the fact that people are uncomfortable talking about it. Nobody wants to show that they had a struggle getting to where they are. And I think that that's an important thing to start speaking about because I remember my high school, Brooklyn Tech, great high school, you had majors within your second year. Um, I was doing industrial design, I had friends doing architecture, law, chemical engineering, biomedical engineering, all these things uh, that I thought all high schools were teaching their students. <laughs> yeah, see, exactly, after you leave, <laughs> after you leave and you realize, no, uh, a lot of other people weren't getting exposed to that, um, you really start to notice um, kind of where these feelings come from. Um, and like, I have friends from Kingsboro to Harvard, right? And we talk about all the people that we've met, all the things that everyone was exposed to up until this point, and we realized that everyone wasn't as privileged as us. Now, from when I was small, my mother had me in basketball to Girl Scouts, so I didn't think that there was anything girls couldn't do. Like, that wasn't even in my mind. I was like, I can be in basketball shorts, my hair cornrowed, and then take it out and be curly in my cute little Girl Scouts outfit and sell some cookies, if that's what I wanted to do. You know, and I was lucky enough to have somebody behind me that was just like, whatever you want to do, tell me, we'll do it. I was on the swim team, volleyball, whatever it was. Um, if I wanted to do arts, fine. But not everyone was privileged enough to have that. And not everyone was privileged enough to um, be exposed to you know, a bunch of careers and things that I was. And realizing that, like I guess the imposter syndrome consciously hit me when I was in college, when I realized there are other people that think I can't do what I know I can do. And of course, me being that hard-headed girl, I was like, okay, so I have to be in either media or technology because there are no black women in them, and I have to be the one to show them that black women can't be in this. And that was one of the things that Joyce pointed out in the book, the fact that, yeah, that's great. You know, it is great to have that idea in your head, but it's also a very heavy burden 
to carry because then you fear even more. I can't make a mistake because if I make the mistake, then they're gonna have it in their heads that of course, you see, you know, she's a woman, she's a black woman, you know, she didn't really grow up the way we grew up, so she wouldn't really know how to handle certain things. Um, and I think that that does, like I said before, make us afraid to ask because we want to act like we know everything. And especially as college students going into the, like our first jobs, we're like, they hired us because they think we know everything, obviously, you know? <laughs> so if we go in there and we ask questions, they're gonna feel like they made a mistake in hiring us. When, no, you're 20, 22, they don't expect you to know all that much. And it's okay, you know, I, when I left my high school and I had some of my friends that were going into engineering and I was sitting here like, well, I don't really wanna be an engineer per se. I need to figure out what I wanna do. Of course, the math and sciences were seen as top tier for me, you know, because that's what I had. I've always been a talker. I didn't really see that as a gift. It just kind of was a thing that I did. <laughs> um, so when I was at Black Girls Code and they started asking me to go speak on behalf of them, to speak on behalf of you know girls and why STEM is important, I was like, well, I know some engineers that can do it. Why don't, why don't you ask them? <coughs> but they were good at their math and sciences, and I was good at articulating why. It's important, but I didn't. I didn't see that as a gift because that was, you know, just a part of who you are. So I think that a lot of it is too that we have to look within ourselves and realize that some of our own experiences that other people might not have had are exactly what make us quote unquote gifted or worthy, I guess. Um, and I totally just threw a blank. Sorry. Um, I think that. Instead of going into things thinking that you need to be the best all the time, we need to focus more on finding our fit and figuring out what it is that we're good at and looking within ourselves and realizing that we do have things specifically, especially through our experiences that set us apart from a lot of people and enhance those things. And being around groups of people that will bring that stuff out of you. Like I know when she started saying all the things that I do, it sounds like I do a lot, like I'm part of this group and this group and that group and this and that. A lot of these are just, you know, organizations that meet, you know, say once every two months. We get together, we talk for a little bit, you know, they have a speaker or something. And, you know, it, it's not that I'm like the head of every single organization, but I'm surrounded by very, very inspiring people. Um, who encourage me to do better. All of my friends are very, very encouraging of me. And if I try to put myself down, they will shut me down very, very quickly. And I try to do that for my friends too. Um, whenever they put themselves down, I, I try to remind them of you know the fact that we tend to look at everyone in front of us and see you know the head of the company, this manager, this manager, and we never look at all the people behind us, all the people that are looking up to us thinking, I wish I knew what she knew. I wish I could do what she could do. I, I wish I could speak as well as she could. I wish I could record video as well as she can. Um, and I think we need to make people conscious of that. I think that that is, I think once you become conscious of the fact that you have, I won't even call it an issue, um, you have a habit of treating yourself as if you don't deserve a seat at the table, you can start to focus on all of the little triggers, as she mentioned before, that um, make you feel that way. And from there, I think you're able to build on that and build on it more. All right. Thank you to our panelists. There was a lot there. Um, so at this point, um, I think we've heard a lot of information this morning, very important information, things that we, we probably needed to hear from Ms. Roche and all of our panelists. Now is the time when you guys get to talk. Um, and we are going to open it up for some Q&A um, uh, from our keynote speaker and from any of our panelists. I have Cassie who's walking around with a microphone so that we can all make sure we hear your wonderful questions. Uh, is there anybody who wants to be the brave soul and ask the first question? Ah, over here behind the pillar. 
Go, one second, she's gonna bring you the microphone. And when you, when you uh, get the microphone, please stand up, say your name um, and your uh, class designation, and go ahead. My name is Obdulia Ambros, and I am from Cape. Um, the question, my question is for Ms. Carol Robles. Uh, she mentioned that she has a girl power school program somewhere. I would like to know where it is. Girl power school is right here. Oh. And, <laughs> and uh, I, I deliver it on, on campuses um, around the country. And it's uh, girl power school, GPS, setting your GPS for success. And there is actually online, um, if you Google my name and CNN, there is an eight minute clip that gives a good summary uh, in a CNN interview. And the, um, the interview culminates on, and I'll share a quick story, um, what I consider to be the culmination of Girl Power School was the, the nomination and the subsequent confirmation of Sonia Sotomayor, which I thought was it epitomizes everything that I teach about Girl Power School. It was mentorship, it was networking, and it was really a lot of women's organizations, male organizations, I mean, it was just people of goodwill coming together and working towards a common goal. Uh, and then I, I, I unpack that and I talk about how, how that happened. Wonderful, thank you. Um, does anyone else have a, a question? Looking out. Oh, I have one. Oh. If there's nobody. I know they're going to warm up. They will. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody likes being first. Yeah. You can so warm up I'm the crowd just, for I'm us. Gonna ask, I'm, I'm going to ask a question that's related to generations, if anybody can take it. So I'm wondering, uh, although we heard from our student and she recognizes a bit the imposter syndrome, you know, with the generation that we're raising today, quote unquote, who are so empowered, Dr. Rogers. Uh, maybe even a little self-centered. I don't know, just my language. Is the imposter syndrome gone because we're raising folk differently? <laughs> or can it still go on, you know, today? You know, do you see any generational, you've done some of the research in terms of people, do you see any differences in the generation? And then I'd love to hear from you too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. It was, it's interesting, when I decided to do the book, um, someone challenged me on that, and I said, I don't know. You know, I honestly didn't know whether or not folks still dealt with it. Um, and I said, but I'm gonna do the book, and if it can be helpful to one person, then that will be sufficient. Um, as I've been speaking, and I've been speaking all across the country, um, in companies and conferences and in universities, colleges, um, and I have found that it still very much is alive and well. Um, and it is a situation where, um, to some degree, there may be even less of an ability to deal with it, uh, because um, there has been more reinforcement of your value <laughs> And when you hit one of those situations, it can really throw you for a loop. And I, and I had young women come up to me and say, you know, I needed to hear this today because I didn't know where to go with it. Um, and so I, it is alive and well. I think we've got to continue to be open and honest um, in understanding that, it, that, that, that those feelings can exist. But you know, the comment about being an authentic, the authentic self is critical. And you can only get there if you learn how to internally validate yourself. And that's really the message that's there. And so we've got to continue to have it from very young to continue to have that message go out. So I found that it has it's not been generational. Okay. Thank you. I, I tend to agree um, with Ms. Roche. I, I think the, the critical piece here is because there is differences in terms of how um, generations process, a lot of what um, this, this um, phenomenon of imposter syndrome looks like, I think one's inability to find the appropriate networks and resources that are available to them may manifest themselves in inappropriate type of outcomes. 
Um, so we see that there's more aggressive behavior, in particular with females, that exists now. There's a lot of research out there on that. And so while we know it exists, the question is what resources do we need to put in place? And I'm glad to hear about the different programs that exist you know, within the community. Again, I'm always gonna go back to mentoring and what we have a responsibility to help people figure out how to you know, um, put it in perspective of what they're actually experiencing. Because what I do want to say is, please make no mistake, I do not think that the imposter syndrome is not relevant for many. I am saying that there's still an alternative perspective of what we need to do when that does exist and how we need to code the language. But I also wanted to say to each of you that we have right here on your college, we have services. You know, we have the Women's Center, we have the Men's Center, we have the Counseling Center. Um, I physically walk student scholars downstairs. I teach Introduction to Social Work, I also teach Advanced Research, but it's in my Introduction to Social Work that, you know, it, it, it addresses everything. It, from micro meso and all of the macro level issues that things begin to come up. And it's the first time someone discloses and they really need some support. So we have to be very open and understanding that resources are critical and we should not limit it to it's one generation or another. I just think that we've been conditioned generationally, also regionally. Like where folk grew up and we, I, I, my parents born and raised in Alabama, but I am a New Yorker. So my, my spirit, my rhythm, it's quite different than, you know, folk from the South. Like, you just don't get to say certain things, you know? It, 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 there's a difference in our approach, and so I think we also have to be very mindful to who we also bring to the conversation. So people show up different, but you still should show up with who you know who you are and how you need to address whatever your you know issues are, what your concerns are, and what the presentation needs to be for you. Not for everyone else, because it will look different. The lens is different for everyone that's sitting in this room. I'm going to ask Allison to, to say a couple of words on this, because uh, you and I had a conversation probably early last week. And I think when I was looking for a student to serve on this panel, so many people, oh, no, I, I couldn't do that. I don't. Who else is on the panel? Oh, no, I'm not in the league with them. And I think we, as you know, and I think young people, put people on a pedestal, right? Well, they're over there and I don't have the credentials. I don't have this and so no one's gonna wanna hear what I have to say. Um, when really we just wanted a student, a, a, an average student, to give their thoughts. And so Allison and I spoke about this probably a couple of days ago. So can you give a comment, Allison? Uh, I can give a few, okay. Uh, <laughs> so um, I was saying before that I know with uh, Black Girls Code, they started sending me to speak on their behalf and you know talk about being a minority girl in STEM. Um, and when they first started sending me to speak, I was so nervous. I was so nervous. But when I went, I think um, the Omega fraternity has a black college tour for their high school students, and they sent me to speak at BMCC for them. And the principal of a high school then said, hi, we have this uh, career day. Uh, would you be willing to speak? And I'm saying, I don't have a career. <laughs> uh, but uh, I was like, you know what? The one thing I've learned is that whenever people come up to me and they're just like, you're amazing. To, instead of just trying to downplay it, I'm just like, you see something. So, okay, I'm just gonna go off of what you see. Even if I don't see it, I'm not gonna sit here and try to downplay it. Thank you for whatever you see. And you know, it, it's happened to the point of me just stopping, you know, trying to deflect any, um, anybody um, praising me for any accomplishments. Even if uh, sometimes, you know, stuff that I don't even think is an accomplishment. Like going to speak at a panel, I'm like, well, so? <laughs> That's an accomplishment. Um, yeah, see, exactly. Um, and from there, uh, when I was speaking at her panel, someone invited me to speak at a panel for the Department of Ed. And that I just thought was super cool because I was like, this is official now, you know? Because um, what we were talking about before with a lot of college students, when we're involved with clubs or things on campus, we don't really see it as real, you know, unless it's like, well, I worked for Google or I worked for Verizon or I worked for some big name company and this was my title. We don't see it as a real accomplishment, but it's those things that end up getting you those jobs because at the end of the day, all companies are, all of these organizations are a group of people working together to get things done and you find your place in that and you bring value to the table and that's it. And that's what you're doing with um, a lot of these clubs. Uh, I remember it too, I, I had a conversation with my brother because he 
I was showing him my resume and he was like, okay, you have this black group, this woman's group, this stuff, nobody's gonna wanna hire you because they're gonna think that you're too confrontational. And I was like, well, I don't wanna work at that company. I, why, why is it that just because I'm a part of these groups that it, it, it makes you uncomfortable? I'm not part of it because I wanna cause problems. It's just that I know that in these industries, being black and being a woman, we have specific issues that we deal with that you might not deal with as you know, being part of another group. And the same thing goes for, you know, say gay people or trans people or any other group of people that is seen as a minority. We go through different things. And having that community around you to talk about it and people that are already in the business to help you deal with that is really helpful, which is why I thought it was great when you were saying um, that we do have to be careful who we invite into that conversation. And it's also important talking to, like, say, another black woman in a profession to know how to bring that conversation up to different groups of people. Because going in, we can't just go in there screaming at the top of our lungs racism and sexism because nobody's gonna wanna work with us. <laughs> but there is a way to talk about it, and it should be talked about. Um, but I, I think that that's uh, where the importance of mentorship comes from. So I don't think it's necessarily a generational thing. Um, I, I think that's gonna be something that's going to continue and continue for generations on. Thank you. Uh, we have a question in the back. Oh, a com that's, that's welcome as well. The microphone is coming to you. <laughs> 